This is section 7.2, part 2. All right, I intentionally split off um, this from the other set of things because those were solids that are gained by revolving a region around an axis of revolution. And this one is very different from that. So I wanted to really make it clear that these are different. Um, what we're going to see here is we're going to have solids that we're going to slice up into pieces like um, like an onion and you're slicing and you get a cross section of that. Um, what we're going to do is look at the cross sections and see if we can find the volume of that cross section, which may not be cylindrical is what I'm trying to get at. Volumes of revolution always give you something that's circular. So a, a cylinder, a disc washer is a good model. But sometimes when you make a cut, um, that's you always cut it it's the same way. In each one of those little pieces that you get, those, those segments of the solid, um, those will, in this type of problem, always be some certain shape. It could have been a circular shape, but it might be a square that you see, or a triangle, or a pentagon, or you know whatever figure you want, and that, then it'll have thickness. So in reality, we're talking about uh, a prism. So let's talk a little bit about prisms, because that's what we're going to see here. Let's say that we cut um, into slices, and every slice we get is square in shape, and it has thickness like that. Or let's say it's rectangular where the sides of the rectangle are not equal in length. Oops. That was messy. Let me try again. Um, so it's, it's uh, rectangular and it has thickness and you'll get a prism that looks like that. Or when you slice it, the slice looks like a triangle, but it has thickness. And so that's a prism. And so the, the volume of a prism in general, and we use this with a cylinder because it is a prism as well, is it, the area of the base, which for the cylinder was pi r squared, times the height of the prism. So in a more general sense, this is what we're going to do, where b is the area of the face of that section. So Let's just make this up and, and say, for example, that this is x. And since I said it was a square, this would be x. And let's just for the purpose of um, generality, let's just say that all of the thicknesses are delta x because there were delta x rectangles to start with. Well, the volume of that is going to be x squared, which is the area of the face of that. The area of a square is side times side times height, which is delta x. And uh, this one would be, uh, let's say this is x, and it's delta x thick. And this one is x plus 3 or something. Then the volume of a rectangular prism is length times width times height, which would be x times x plus 3 times delta x, and you probably distribute and get x squared plus 3x multiplied by delta x. But at least it would start out to be visibly length times width times height, and then it can maybe be simplified. And um, for the triangle, let's say that the distance this way for the triangle is um, x and the distance this way along the triangle is, I don't know, 4x plus 1. I'm just making this up, so it doesn't really matter if it's going to work. Um, it's more about the, the idea. So the area of the triangle is 1 half base times height times the thickness the height of the prism, delta x. And that one too you probably would distribute. I'm not going to on this one. I'm just going to tell you 
that that would be the formula to start with. And there are lots of other formulas that you know. For example, um, for a triangle, if if I gave you a triangle that looks, I don't know, maybe like this, this is not supposed to be a right triangle, um, and I knew something about this angle and this side and this side. Do you remember from pre-cal the area formula for um, that triangle? This is something you're supposed to know, so um, it's not a unworthy question. Um, the answer is the area is one half a b sine of theta times, and again let's make this delta x. And another thing that you might need to review is the law of cosines, uh, which says that the side that you don't know squared is equal to a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine of the angle opposite the side that you, that's over here by itself. You might need the law of sines. Um, these are all pre-calculus things that you may need to know in order to get going on some of these problems. Let's <sighs> see. Um, trying to think if there's anything that occurs. Oh, I know. If you have a cross-section that when you cut this thing into pieces, that cross-section ends up being a semicircle with thickness delta x. Let's say this is from here to there is x. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take the area of a full circle, and since that's a semicircle, divide it by 2. So the volume is going to be the area of the face, 1 half of pi r squared, where in this picture r is x, 1 half pi r squared is the area of the face, times the thickness delta x. So these are the pre-calculus ideas that will take us in toward the integral. We will find which one of these is a representative one, and one of these formulas, or something like one of them, will be our uh, formula for finding one volume of one representative um, slice of this solid. And then we'll add up all such volumes of all the prisms that you've created. And then to get an integral, we'll take the limit of that sum of volumes as n approaches infinity, and get an integral. Okay, so that's, that, again, that's another iteration of our theme. So, um, I think those are the ones that I thought of. Um, if something else comes up, then we'll just review the pre-calculus notion if there's something I forgot to mention here. Okay, so in general, uh, what we're going to see is that if the volume of a prism is the area of the face of that prism times the thickness of that prism, that's what we're going to be adding. So we would have the limit as n approaches infinity of the Riemann sum sigma i equals 1, so from the first rectangle to the nth one, of this area formula of the cross-section what is its area of the face of that cross-section times the thickness of the cross-section delta x, which will lead us to an integral from a to b of the area formula for the face of that prism times dx. And by the same token, and that'll be the volume, by the same token, um, if it were a delta y problem, that volume We'll have a very similar formula. It'll be the integral from C to D of the area of that face of the cross-section as a function of y times dy. So those are the two formulas for this that you'll need to know.
you see how this is different from the volumes of solids of revolution. Uh, we don't have a pi, and we don't have radius squared or anything like that. This is just the area of the face integrated from A to B. All right. And uh, I think on the page, uh, the slide that's talking about these two formulas, there are some pretty good pictures showing what those would look like. Um, and it looks like uh, the cross sections will either be made so that the cross sections, when it's like if, my analogy for this is going to be loaf of bread, by the way. I'm going to go ahead and say that now before I forget to say it and talk about why I say, call it that. We just have really interesting loaves of bread. And the solid that we've created is what I'm going to call a loaf of bread. And if you have a solid, we're, we're going to take a knife and cut, and they're going to tell us how to cut. They'll say the cross sections are parallel to this or perpendicular to that. And that'll tell us which way to hold our knife and slice. And if we do two cuts really close to each other, then um, that width of between those two, I'm going to call that a piece of bread. Um, that piece of bread, we're going to look at it, and they're going to tell us what does the face of that piece of bread look like? Is it a square? Is it a rectangle? Is it a semicircle? Is it a triangle? Whatever. And then from that, we're going to use the area of the face of the cross section times the delta x or delta y, whichever one is appropriate, and integrate that to get our volume. Okay, so that's that's going to be the basic idea. So um, the first example you see there, example five, uh, where we're actually going to do this. The base of the solid is a region bounded by the lines. So let me. Um, I forgot one word here. Analogy. Um, we're going to look at, and they're trying to draw, I don't know if, if I, I can't remember if I gave you these pictures or not, but they're trying to have you see what the solid looks like, which is really cool when you get to see it, but it's not necessary to do the problem. Um, what we're going to be told is that the base of the solid is going to be in the xy plane, and they're going to tell us what that base looks like, what the boundaries of that base. So it's like the crust on the bottom of the bread where it touches the pan that it's being baked on. That's the part that's in the xy plane, and they'll usually describe that to us. And so here they say the base of the solid is the region bounded by the lines um, f of x equals 1 minus x over 2. So um, let's say this is uh, one here, one here, and one here. Um, for that line, y equals 1 minus x over 2. The y-intercept is 1. The slope is negative 1 half. So I'm going to go down 1, right 2, and draw that line. So that's one of the boundaries for the base of my solid. Then they say another boundary is g of x equals negative 1 plus x over 2. Well, that just told me I messed up and didn't draw this to go far enough down. So there's negative 1. And um, I forgot to label this one. This is F. And I'll draw G. Have you noticed how my color coding of this is helping you see things? Um, I would say that if you want to adopt this, get some color pencils and draw your figures with different colors, and it, you can really see what's going on a bit better. Anyway, y intercept is negative 1, the slope is 1 half, so we're going to go up 1 over 2. Which, by the way, since I just graphed that, I know exactly where these things cross each other. Oops. Let me make it look better. Start down here and draw it. Good old freehand drawing. Ooh. Always looks so wonderful, right? Until I mess up. Anyway, um, now I am going to use what I told you earlier. Um, well, let me back off from that. Um, 
we need to read what they tell us. Oh, and the other boundary, man, I'm really messing up here. The other boundary is the line x equals zero, the y-axis. So that triangle is the base of our solid. Okay, now we have to read how they're cutting this thing. That's really important because um, we'll get different answers if we do the wrong one. The cross sections are perpendicular to the x-axis. So the cut would be perpendicular to the x-axis. And then I'm going to cut again perpendicular to the x-axis. That's my two cuts. And I'm going to get a piece of bread. And I'm going to let a rectangle approximate the actual um, thing there. It's not perfect, so we're going to get a bunch of things that, like remember that wedding cake example? It's going to look kind of like that, but it's going to be stacked, maybe not disks, but stacked something else. And that's okay, that approximation is good as long as we force the sum of all of these to go to infinity, infinitely many rectangles, um, we're good. Okay, so you might notice once I've drawn that, that that's delta x in width. Very important that you realize that. Okay, so um, they tell us that the cross sections we get when we cut perpendicular to the x-axis, they tell us those are equilateral triangles. So it's a triangular base and a triangular shape. That didn't have to happen. It could have been semicircular shapes or rectangular shapes or whatever, but they told us it's an equilateral triangle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up the piece of bread that I got, and this is the, the rectangle that's, I've picked up the piece of bread and there's the rectangle that was on the bottom of the, that's the crust at the bottom of the loaf of bread. And I'm gonna draw the face of this um, figure. And they tell me it's an equilateral triangle. So I'm gonna try my best to make it look equilateral. I hope I succeed. And then I'm gonna make this look 3D by showing the thickness that way as well. Uh, not a perfect picture, probably one of my worst ones, but that's all right. So the thickness of that prism is delta x. Now, another important aspect of this is finding out the length of the piece of the rectangle, how that plays into the prism over to the right. And I intentionally said that that in fact, I probably should have drawn some of this in a different color. Let me back up. Whoops. Well, wow. oops. Okay, so here's that bottom crust of bread again. That's delta x thick. And we get a, a equilateral triangle. And I'm going to do this to make it look 3D. Okay, still not great, but you get the idea, I hope. Now, we're going to have to relate the dimension of that triangle that's represented in red to our original picture. So this is spanning from the pink on the top to the green on the bottom. And anytime we want to know something between two things, if you recall from what we talked about earlier, that distance um, is going to be t the top function f of x minus the bottom function g of x. That's what that length of the rectangle is. Okay. And again, if you had trouble thinking about that, you could have said with example numbers of your own choosing, let's just say that this is 7, which is stupid because it stops at 1. But anyway, let's say that's 7 and let's say this is negative 3 down here. How far is it from 7 to negative 3? Well, obviously it's 10. That could be obtained by taking 7 minus the negative 3, which would be the top value, f, minus the bottom value, g, to get that distance of 10, which doesn't make sense in this problem, but the numbers don't matter. It's that you get the right idea. So um, the dimension um, that we get from the picture on the left is that this rectangle is f of x, notice I'm doing substitution here, minus g of x long.
We probably want to simplify that. Um, that's 1 minus x over 2. Distributing the negative, that becomes plus 1 minus x over 2. Combining like terms, you get 2 minus x, which isn't horrible. Okay, now since it's an equilateral triangle, you might know a formula for the area of, a, of an equilateral triangle. I don't. I mean, I've seen it, but I, I never can remember it. So it's no good to me if I don't remember it. So I'm going to have to kind of figure this out on my own. And sometimes you'll be faced with this. You'll be faced with the problem like, oh, dang, I don't know how to find that. But I know, I mean, I don't know the formula for that, but I know how I can figure it out. So that's going to be a, a thing. So I'm going to first of all draw in a... Uh, height for my triangle. And since it's equilateral, of course that means that this is a 60, 60, 60 um, degree triangle. All the angles are 60 degrees. And by drawing that hypotenuse, um, I bisected the angle at the top, which means this is now 30. And this is 60, of course, because it was equilateral. And so we have a 30, 60, 90 right triangle. Um, and one thing I remember from pre-calculus is that if I have a 30, 60, 90 right triangle, the ratio of the sides are the short side is one unit, the hypotenuse is double that, and the other leg is square root of three. Okay, so since I know that, um, the half of the base is the base of this triangle over here. So that distance is half of 2 minus x, which of course is 1 minus x over 2. Okay, so that's the base of my triangle is that. So one of those and then if we use the hypotenuse, it should be twice that. So the hypotenuse should be twice uh, that value that we just got, which is 2 minus x. Well, no duh, it's an equilateral triangle. So whatever this dimension is, all three sides are that same length. So I'm just kind of, kind of confirming that stuff we should have figured out to begin with, but that's okay. And then the other leg of that triangle is going to be square root of 3 times that length. Square root of 3 times 1 minus x over 2. Okay, and that's the height of the triangle. So, I think we've now figured out enough information to find the area of the face of this, the area of the triangle, is going to be one half of b, one half of one minus x over two, times h, one half base times height. So that's going to be square root of three times one minus x over two. Or, in other words, square root of 3 over 2 times 1 minus x over 2 squared. Okay, so the volume of this is going to be the integral. Um, since it's a dx integral, because it's delta x, we want to go from the low x of the region to the high x of the region. That means go from 0 to the point of intersection where x is 2. Notice if we'd accidentally done dy, it would go from negative 1 to 1. And it would be two different things because you'd be going from the vertical to the green below the x-axis and from the vertical to the pink above the axis. So we really don't, I'm glad we didn't have to do that. Anyway, back to this. So uh, we're going to integrate from 0 to 2 the area formula we just found. times 
uh, delta x, which is dx. And there's our integral. OK, so um, when you finish this one, this is another good practice one, uh, not far enough away so that I feel like you can't handle it, uh, this is the answer you should get. Let me remind you that probably the best way to integrate this, well, there are two good ways because it's only squaring, is you can do the squaring and distribute the square root of 3 over 2, and you'll have a polynomial looking expression to integrate. Or you could do u substitution where u is 1 minus x over 2. And those are a couple of, oh, let's do that one to practice because we haven't talked about u substitution. Uh, so I actually want to do this one. So I know I wrote the answer, but let's talk about the work that would get us there because I think that's worthy of our attention. So if I let u equal 1 minus x over 2, that means that du is 0 minus 1 half times dx. And in order to replace everything there in terms of u, to write du, I have to have negative 1 half times dx. And I have the dx, of course. I don't have the negative 1 half. So I'm going to introduce that because I can by multiplying by negative 1 half that by itself, it would be false. I can't just multiply by negative 1 half because I want to. But what I can do is multiply by 1. And the form of 1 I'm going to pick is negative 1 half times negative 2. And that negative 2 I'm going to write out in front. Okay, And so I'll go over here and write it out. So that's going to be negative 2 integral of square root of 3 over 2 times u squared du, because that dx and negative 1 half absorb together to become du. Now, because this is a du integral, we have to be careful. A dx integral means that we're going from x equals 0 to x equals 2. That doesn't mean that u is changing from 0 to 2. So what we're going to have to do, besides changing the variable to u, we have to change, change the upper and lower bounds accordingly. So if x is 0, the lower bound, what is u equal to? Well, the thing that we're going to use for that is our substitution rule. We said u was going to be 1 minus x over 2. Substitute 0 in for x. 1 minus 0 over 2 is 1. So when x is 0, the lower bound, the lower bound for u will be 1 instead. Okay, The upper bound of this one is 2, is what the x value is. What's the corresponding value of u? 1 minus 2 over 2. 1 minus 1 is 0. Now you may be thinking, oh no, my lower bound is bigger than my upper bound. That's actually OK. I don't want you to worry about it. Um, too much. Uh, let me just mention that if I wanted to, I'm not going to do this on this problem because it's not necessary, but if I ever had bounds that were switched from how I wanted them, this is a, a calculus one property of integrals. If that's switched from how I want it to be, I really want to, for whatever reason, I just feel like I have to write from A to B. You can do that as long as you put a negative sign in front of your integral. So you can change or switch, interchange the upper and lower bound if you multiply by negative 1. Well, if you look over here, if I did that, it would go from 0 to 1, and that negative 2 would change to positive 2 when I multiply by negative 1. So it would work out that way. I mention it only because some of you might be a little bit concerned that that goes from big value to small value. It doesn't concern me that much, to be quite honest, because it works out if you just treat it straight up like it is. Okay, so I'm going to take that square root of 3 over 2 out, multiply it by the negative 2, and get negative square root of 3. Then the antiderivative of u squared is 1 third u cubed, evaluated from 1 to 0. So that's negative square root of 3 over 3 times 0 cubed minus negative square root of 3 over 3 times 1 cubed. 
and when you simplify that you get 2 square roots of 3 over 3 or you should let me double check that what did I do wrong Well, I must have done something wrong. Let me think about this a second. Okay, I see my problem. I see what I did wrong. Um, I only found the area of the right triangle on the right side of that. I didn't really do the entire triangle. So uh, the easy fix because I probably should have realized that the base of that triangle, the big triangle, was 2 minus x. And I treated it as half of that accidentally. So I only did half of this region. I only did the right side of that right triangle. So a quick fix would be to just double what I have here. So I'm going to multiply this by 2 to account for the fact that I used this B, which is half of what it should have been, this B, right over here. So um, that would actually cancel this 2. And so this is not a 2 here. And um, so let's go back over here to where the work is. That 2 is not there at all. Okay, so um, it doesn't multiply by the negative 2 and, and go away. So this should have been negative 2 square roots of 3 because the 2 didn't cancel. And this should have been negative 2 square roots of 3 minus negative 2 square roots of 3 over 3 times 1 cubed, um, which ends up being the correct answer. I apologize for that. And you can see how even uh, with the best of intentions, it's really easy in a complicated problem like this to make some silly, simple error, like forgetting that you've only looked at half of the triangle instead of the whole triangle and not get the correct answer. So um, sometimes it'll be as easy as that. You just missed something like I did. So I apologize. Um, hopefully that won't happen again. But it lets you see that I'm human at least, so I guess there is some value to that. Example 6. All right, example 6. We have to find the volume of the solid, which has as its base in the xy plane, that base, that bottom of the loaf of bread, the part that's touching the pan in the xy plane, is described by the ellipse x squared plus 4y squared equals 36. Well, just think of all the college algebra and pre-calculus you're getting to review. How nice that is. Okay, so the standard form for an ellipse um, doesn't look like that. It's going to be a fraction plus a fraction equals 1. So I'm going to divide both sides by 36 to get it into the more familiar form so we can uh, graph it more easily. 4y squared over 36 cancels to be y squared over 9. And 36 divided by 36, of course, is 1. And so that means that the center of the ellipse is at 0, 0. It's x minus 0, which is squared. So, and y minus 0, which is squared. So the center is at 0, 0. Um, I know most pre-cal books call um, the number underneath that, the, uh, what's in this problem, the x squared, the larger of the two. They call that a squared, and the one underneath, in this case y, um, would be called b squared. But I call this the x radius instead. The x radius is the square root of that number underneath x squared, 6, and the y radius is square root of 9, which is 3. So if we go to graph this ellipse,
Let me put a scale here. Um, our center is at 0, 0. Our x radius is 6, which means we're going to go in the x direction 6 units. So go to the right 6, to the left 6. And the y radius is 3, so we're going to go from the center in the y direction 3, so up 3 and down 3. Then do your best to draw an ellipse that passes through those points. Uh, again, the, the picture itself doesn't have to be perfect. You want it to look sort of correct. And as you'll see in a second, you kind of really want to know um, where the vertices and the endpoints of the minor axis are because we might need those, uh, as you'll see in a second. Okay, so that's just the base. That's the, the bottom of the loaf of bread that we can see if we picked it up off the pan. That's what the, the bottom of the loaf of bread would look like. Now, they tell us that our cross sections are parallel to the x axis. So I need to draw a cut that's parallel to the x axis, like maybe make a cut here and make a cut here, both of which are parallel to the x axis. And that creates a rectangular strip. Boy, that doesn't look like it's supposed to. Uh, remember, ellipse is a symmetric figure, so that should be symmetric with respect to the y-axis and the x-axis, and my picture doesn't look like that's what happened, but oh well. So you have to know something about what you're working with and don't rely too heavily on a bad picture. Like, this is a pretty bad picture of what's really going on. Um, I think a lot of it was because I, I, on the left, it's lower than on the right. In fact, let me just try that again, because it looks so bad, I'm ashamed. <laughs> let me just try that again. So let me try to make this so that it works out prettier. Okay, that's better. Whew. Boy, I like that may, way, way better. All right, so um, those are the cross sections that we cut. And so if I take that cross section uh, that I've cut from the loaf of bread and I get a piece of bread, here's the bottom crust of that piece of bread. Then uh, I need to realize that that's delta y that's the width of that rectangle, which is really important for setting up our integral in a few minutes. Um, now, I didn't read the whole thing, but it said that these cross sections cut parallel to the x-axis are squares. So that means that if I can draw a good square, that's what our piece of bread looks like. Almost like a regular piece of bread from a regular loaf, right? Kind of looks like that. All right, so the important connection is to make between the length of that rectangle in the original picture, that's the length of the base of that um, prism uh, face that's square. Okay, so how far is it, we said this before, but I want you to make sure you've reviewed this. How far is it from the x-axis to the curve? Well, that's a measure of x. And because of symmetry, that means that the whole length is 2x. And I'm making an assumption here that x is positive. Notice I drew it to the right, so that x would be a positive number. Of course, if it goes to the right 3, um, the total length is 6, not 3 and negative 3, which is 0 or something. So be real careful about that. So this length is 2x. Again, assuming that x is positive. Well, since it's a square, this dimension is also 2x. So the area of the face of that is um, side times side, or side squared, either way you want to think about it, which is, look like a parenthesis, 4x squared. And so the volume is going to be the integral of that area formula we just found, d, be careful, it's delta y, that's dy. Oops, this is the first time this has happened, and I'm glad it didn't happen until now so that you could understand what's going on. Um, 
it has to be a dy integral because we cut our slices parallel to the x-axis, which created a delta y rectangle. So um, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that 4 out. And notice I haven't talked about the bounds yet. Well, let's do that first. Um, since it's dy, we have to go from the lowest y of the region to the highest y of the region. That's the base of the loaf of bread. So that's going to be from negative 3 to 3. So this is another reason why you want to have graphed this, so that you can easily see that that goes from negative 3 to 3. If we'd done a delta x situation, that integral would have gone from negative 6 to 6. So that's something to be aware of. So what am I going to do with that x squared? That's supposed to be a function of y, not a function of x. Well, if you look at the original equation, which governs the whole base, this equation right here, is it possible to solve that equation for x squared, the thing that I have right now? Well, yeah, all I have to do is subtract 4y squared from both sides, and that means I can take out the x squared and replace it with 36 minus 4y squared dy. This one I am going to let you use as practice to practice your Calculus 1 skills. And I'm just going to tell you the answer. It's 576. And make sure you can get that. And if you can't get any of these that I'm just giving you the answer for without showing the work, um, please ask me in class because that is work you should be able to do without a calculator on your own. So if you're having trouble with that, please ask because I don't want this to become something you can't handle because it's really not going to be that hard. I, at least I hope not for most of you. Uh, you're going to be able to do this. All right. So that ends this lesson. Um, I will see you in class.